this. Hi, everybody. I will be with you in a minute after I do a bit of sharing. Hi, Greg. Hi, Dolores. Hi, Jim. Hey, Steve. Hey, Valina, be with you in a minute. Just a little more sharing to do. Okay, here I am, everyone. You should be able to see and hear me now. And since I last said hello, Steve Wolf Brandt has joined. And also Taylor Ashley. Uh, welcome to you, Taylor.
And Bonnie's joined. Hi, honey. Okay, so before I get into CBO and why it must go, I'm going to quickly go to two items you know, to direct your attention to those. So we'll discuss those for a very short time. But they are wonderful to see. So it seems like another new day, another new poll. And here we are at Common Dreams again. And John Kelly there. I suppose he pronounces his name that way, or maybe Keeley, I'm not sure. Uh, but a new poll shows... Bernie Sanders with more than double the support of Joe Biden in New Hampshire. Now, this is the um, ARG poll. It came out uh, um, 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 today. It reflects a survey taken from January 24th to January 27th. And there were some 600 people. Uh, since independents can vote in the Democratic primary in uh, by New Hampshire. These are all likely voters. They were surveying. Uh, actually, a bunch of likely voters in New Hampshire. And the overall results were that um, but Bernie has the support of 28% of likely voters in the primary compared to Joe Biden's 13%. Now a 15-point lead. This contrasts with uh, the um, nine-point lead we saw just yesterday. Uh, coming in third and fourth place are Pete with 12% and Elizabeth Warren with 11%. So Warren has fallen now to 11%. And notice the surprise result here. Fifth at 8% is Tulsi Gabbard. Not too much of a surprise to me, but it might be a surprise to some. I've had the feeling that um, Tulsi has been doing very well in New Hampshire for some time, actually. And when she does a town hall or something like that, okay, or gives a speech, she's very compelling and very likable. So she's been ignored, of course, by the mass media. That's been a tremendous weight on her campaign. But doesn't stop her from doing well in um, New Hampshire or that type of state where retail politics, okay, is very important. So between Bernie and Tulsi, they have 36% uh, of the vote. Uh, the Buttigieg, okay, and Biden totals a 25% of the vote. And Warren um, has about 11%. Some of her support uh, would likely go to um, Sanders, some would go to, or to either Buttigieg okay, or to Biden. But this still means that uh, the lead for progressives is substantial. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. This poll case, okay, an ARG poll. Uh, ARG is the American Research Group. Um, other recent surveys of finding Sanders ahead by between five points and 12 points. And he leads by an average of eight points at, uh, in uh, New Hampshire in the real clear politics um, average. 
So it's a pretty solid lead now. And the big moneyed interests are getting very nervous as polling continues to uh, to move in the direction uh, of the senator. If you click on a link here, I should be clicking on the link. I should be clicking on the link to the survey. But if you click on that, and you take a look at things, you can see that even when you break uh, down the likely voters by party registration, Bernie has a 31 to 16 lead over Biden. Okay. And Warren is number three when it comes to Democrats alone at 14%. And Buttigieg is at 8%. And Tulsi is only at um, but, oh, but 3% okay, among the Democrats. But she's up at 15% among the, uh, the undeclared who are going to vote um, in the Democratic. Uh, um, um, in the primary of the Democratic um, Party. So that's interesting. Uh, it's interesting also to look at uh, the margin of error in this poll, which is stated to be uh, plus or minus uh, about four percentage points. The ARG has been conducting surveys of voters since uh, 1985. It's a pretty good poll, I think. Sample size in this one was 600 um, telephone um, um, interviews among a random sample of likely primary voters, okay, in the Democratic primary. 335 were Democrats and 265 were um, independents. So that gives you a summary of that poll. That, of course, is a very, very promising poll for Bernie Sanders and has some good things for Tulsi Gabbard okay, as well. Second thing I wanted to cover was a statement by Bernie Today, Trump's peace plan, so-called, uh, with, uh, with Netanyahu, it's a peace deal, okay, but of course, the Palestinians are terribly, terribly opposed to it, and they refer to it okay, as a war deal as opposed to a peace deal. There's an article on that, okay, in Common Dreams as well tonight, but I wanted to focus on Bernie Sanders' response to the deal. This piece is by Jessica Corbett, the staff writer at um, Common Dreams. This is dated also today, January 20th, 2020. And its title is Denouncing Trump Plan is um, Unacceptable. Sanders declares it is time to end the Israeli occupation. I should say so. It was time to end that occupation as early as 1975-1976. That occupation has been a total scandal. It flew in the face okay, of international um, 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 okay, international um, law and uh, world opinion, okay, for the most part. It was an extreme example, okay, of might is right for all these years, and for my money, it's where Israeli foreign policy strayed. That's when it strayed and began to go over to the dark side, if I can use that particular metaphor.
so Bernie made a very forthright statement condemning the proposal is unacceptable. And you know, when Bernie says something is unacceptable, he means unacceptable. That's one of the worst things he can say about anything, that it's unacceptable. And he called for an end to the decades-long occupation of Palestinian territories by um, Israel. He responded to Trump's plan in a pair of tweets envisioning a U.S. policy that is going to promote a just and a durable agreement. And the article notes that Sanders... <laughs> who would be the first uh, president of the Jewish persuasion, added that, quote, Trump's so-called peace deal, unquote, doesn't come close and will only perpetuate the conflict and undermine the security interests of Americans, Israelis, and um, Palestinians. And the article also notes and the White House hopeful comments Tuesday were not the first time Sanders has spoken out in recent months for the Palestinian people. In October 2019, the Senate suggested using the billions of dollars in, uh, um, um, in aid that the United States supplies to Israel each year to pressure uh, the, uh, the Netanyahu government to end its horrific treatment okay, of the Palestinians. Absolutely. Sanders again uh, shows courage and is very um, um, straightforward. Warren chimed in and said the plan was a sham. And she noted the Palestinian leaders have not been involved with crafting the plan. Okay, and as well, Mahmoud Abbas said in a televised address Tuesday, Quote, I say no to Trump and to uh, um, Netanyahu. Jerusalem is not for sale. All our rights are not for sale and are not for bargain. And your deal, the conspiracy, will not pass. So I wanted you to note on that article and that um, piece of news. I think that Bernie made that straightforward statement. Okay, I don't think he intends to or plans to gain anything uh, from it. It was a moral imperative for him. It was the right thing to do. And he took that step quickly and unhesitatingly. Um, now let's go to the main topic of the day, which is CBO must go. This is an article that appeared in the American uh, uh, Prospect entitled Congress's Biggest uh, uh, um, Obstacle. Um, CBO, right? Uh, get it? Congressional Budget Office. Um, CBO is Congress's Biggest Obstacle, CBO. <laughs> And this is a major article on the CBO. Um, but talking about uh, the reform of the CBO. And to see some of the underpinnings and the origins of the article, all you have to do is read the first sentence. Shortly after becoming chief economist to Bernie Sanders, um, 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 uh, to, uh, to Bernie Sanders on uh, the uh, the budget committee in the Senate, 
Stephanie Kelton strung up, struck up a friendship with a colleague who had previously worked um, um, at the CBO. And she said, quote, we would sit and chat. I remember the first conversation he was telling me about um, CBO. He said, quote, when I started with them, the first thing they said is that they stopped stupid shit from happening, unquote. That is how they defined, um, um, how they described uh, the purpose of the CBO. And so Dave Dayan says, there's nothing in the duties and responsibilities, okay, of CBO uh, that suggests that they have that kind of authority. Its mission is supposed to be strictly mathematical. It's supposed to score legislation for uh, uh, its uh, um, action um, uh, um, uh, um, before the projected cost of the legislation um, compared to the bottom line of the government. And it does this over a period of a decade. It also issues broader forecasts about uh, the uh, deficits that are expected, household incomes, and forecasts about the growth in the economy Okay, it well, um, as well. In spite of this original mission okay, of CBO, which would seem to imply that it would have a limited role, it has been very important since its inception in 1974 in U.S. politics. Washington likes to bring complex issues down to simple numbers. As the politics of this have worked out since 1974, the CBO score can define where the legislation lives or dies. As um, Dave Dayan says, even though the score doesn't characterize a bill's uh, goals, just uh, the budgetary impact. And then also quotes okay, an associate dean at, at uh, the, uh, the University of, okay, of Maryland, uh, Philip Joyce. Quote, someone at CBO said to me, if you ask us how much it costs, we'll tell you how much it costs. If you ask us if it's a good idea, we'll tell you how much it costs, unquote. And of course, this gives rise to the question we've heard so often during the primaries this year, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? So, okay, if uh, the coming election goes to the Democrats, and if it goes to the progressive Democrats, and if specifically it goes to Bernie Sanders, Uh, he is going to harbor uh, either ambitions well to the left, okay, of Obama, and looking at Bernie's his agenda right now, it will be the most absolutely progressive one since the days of FDR. And Dave then points out. But at the heart of the plot to stop that president in their tracks will be the opposition's skillful employment of CBO numbers to, quote, unquote, prove that America cannot have nice uh, things. Now, that formulation, the last part about how America cannot have nice uh, things, that comes directly out of an article by Stephanie Kelton in the L.A. Times, I guess about a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, this article, okay, by uh, Dave Dayan and its shape, 
was heavily influenced by the MMT School okay, of Economics and specifically by Stephanie Kelton, its apparent. We can see it. But it's not only true that the heart of the plot to stop the coming president um, in his or her tracks is going to be the way the opposition employs the CBO numbers. How do we know that? We know that because when Obama took over the presidency, the opposition employed uh, the CBO numbers to try to contain um, um, him. Uh, we also know this because since the 1970s, uh, the people who wanted to contain the spending of the federal government and to bring us the 40 years of austerity that we've had have relied on CBO numbers to help them to do that. Okay. Now, yesterday, I went over the new proposal for a budget uh, 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 process uh, reform, the bipartisan proposal. Okay. And we noticed that that proposal, uh, the, oh, that particular bill, relies critically on CBO numbers to kick in an automatic process and a mandatory process uh, for reducing the deficit in the second year of a two-year uh, okay, uh, of a uh, 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 two-year uh, plan for the budget. So CBO is central to that plan, and the purpose of that plan and the purpose of that bill is to trim deficits that may go beyond those that were projected in the first year for the second year of a uh, of the second year of a budget uh, plan. Uh, so Dave Dayan also points out. that there are times where that policy seems to be bad from a budget standpoint, and from the standpoint of whether it's a surplus budget okay, or a deficit budget, where that budget is excellent policy. And there's a quote uh, from... Uh, someone who worked for 31 years in Congress, Scott Scott Lilly, and quote, if you look at World War II, we ended up with a public debt that was 108% of GDP in 1946. So on that basis, he says, we shouldn't have engaged in World War II. We should have let Hitler take over Europe and sat back. According to CBO, that would have been good policy because we would have been more fiscally sound. At least according to the underlying assumptions that CBO is mandated to follow. Because if you ask us whether it's good policy, we'll tell you how much it costs. In World War II, if there had been a CBO, they would have told us that's going to cost an enormous amount, so we can't do it. So CBO says, we have to do a number and we do our best. That's a quote from the current um, 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 the CBO director, Philip uh, Swagel, 
who took over CBO in uh, June. So Dave Dayen points out, there's no Congressional Social Benefits Office. There's no Congressional um, Equality of Life Office. There's no Congressional Policy Impact Office. There's only a Congressional Budget Office. And this is a problem for reasons, decision-making concerning policy. Okay, and Dave Dayen says, and rightly so, it's not that CBO actually governs Washington. It's that Washington, the Congress really, has allowed itself to be governed by CBO and by an unelected collection of well-meaning economists who have been given a fundamentally impossible task. Yes, the 10-year projections even six-month projections are a fundamentally impossible task. We have to note that all the New Deal and Great Society programs passed into law without a CBO score, from Social Security to Medicare, okay, and uh, to, uh, to Medicaid. Like so many dominant elements of our current political framework. CBO dates back to the disruptive period of the 1970s. For the previous 50 years before that, the executive branch handled the planning for the budget. It was done by the Office of the Office okay, of Management okay, and Budget, or the, or the OMB which used to be the Bureau of the Budget in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, when Nixon won in 1972, says Dave Dayen, And he was flush from a very large victory in 1972. Um, as you may recall, he was elected in a landslide victory then, um, prior to uh, his leaving office, um, due to the fact that he was likely to be impeached and convicted. Uh, but anyway, President Nixon decided, uh, right after he took his new term and in 1973, he decided to withhold congressionally appropriated funds for social and environmental programs he didn't like. That's the precedent for some of the things that Donald Trump okay, is doing now. At the time Nixon tried it, it was perfectly legal, or at least it was not okay, an illegal thing to do. It was a procedure used by um, a Thomas... Uh, by Jefferson, and the procedure was called um, impoundment, Jefferson refused to pay $50,000 for 15 gunboats in 1803. Boy, wouldn't we love to pay $15,000 for 15 gunboats in 2020. <laughs> Anyway, the Budget Act that was passed, okay, the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of uh, 1974 wasn't vetoed by Nixon uh, because um, um, he ran into Watergate and he didn't want to anger Congress any further. <coughs> and so the act was successfully passed and became law. <coughs> and it forced all future presidents to seek um, um, congressional approval to impound funds that 
uh, had been appropriated by Congress. But at the time, one other thing that Congress um, actually put into the law was a new capability, which it realized it did not um, um, have before, and which was part of the source of <coughs> the extreme power the executive branch had over the budget. <coughs> And so that same act uh, um, 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 created a budget committee in the Senate and a budget committee in the House. And it required Congress to formally pass an annual resolution um, um, concerning the budget, which, of course, it has very frequently failed to do. And the way it worked was instead of having the total federal budget be the sum of whatever the appropriations committees of Congress approved, the new budget process would agree on the bottom line first, and they then would argue among themselves about who got to appropriate um, um, exactly uh, how much money for what uh, purpose? So to reclaim power from the OMB and the executive branch, the act also created the Congressional Budget Office so it could provide the technical expertise and, quote, objectively estimate uh, the costs. But there were very few details specified in the law. It was left to the first director of the CBO to set up uh, the prerogatives of the committee. And that first head was Alice Rivlin of the Brookings um, Institution. Her appointment was to some degree an accident okay, of politics. But she was lucky and she got uh, the job. And the article gives you the details okay, of the political process. And guess what? Here is a picture of Stephanie Kelton handing out the budget that came out of the committee in 2015. Quote, the goal is to get a permission slip out of CBU, CBO, sorry. It's just a game. Whatever I have to do, um, play with the numbers, make calls, uh, but, um, but lean on them, unquote. Okay, so um, 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 Alice Rivlin, who was one of the greatest hawks when it came to the deficit, a real austerity monger, and the unofficial partner in chief, okay, of Peter G. Peterson, uh, 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 but over the years, died last year at the age, okay, of 88. Funny coincidence, she lived almost as long as Peter G. Peterson, who died, okay, at 89. And if I remember correctly, Peter G. Peterson also died uh, last year in 2000, okay, in 19. They were, over the years, very, very close friends and close supporters, okay, of uh, um, each other. And Rivlin bl uh, would blame the shortfalls in balancing the budget for restraining economic um, uh, growth, which is really, I mean, it's really the opposite, you know, is the way it actually works. Uh, 
Uh, she spent a few years as the director of the CBO, as the head of the CBO, but she's enormously um, 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 influential there. She shaped the agency, really put her stamp on it. She appointed a quite a large number of the initial staff, of course, and she was succeeded by a colleague from the Brooklyn's, uh, 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 from uh, from Brookings, um, Edwin O. Uh, 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 Reischauer, who shared her views. And so, for years, she had a tremendous influence over the CBO. And that remained true through the 1980s, in part because of the influence okay, of Brookings, where she still sat, and with the support okay, of Reischauer, and later directors okay, of the CBO, and the support of think tanks, where Peterson was extremely well connected, Uh, she remained influential for many, many years. In 1994, she was appointed by the Clinton administration. Okay, and in Dave's article, he credits her with being the architect of the Clinton, Clinton era surpluses when she ran, okay, the OMB from 1994 to 1996. Uh, uh, And she was even um, um, important in the deficit fights of 2010, okay, and 11. Uh, when she authored a plan with uh, 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 by Senator Domenici, Uh, that was a rather close alternative to the later Bowles-Simpson uh, scheme. It was a prelude to the Bowles and Simpson plan calling for substantial health care cuts and changing Medicare to a voucher program. That is, she wanted to change it to a voucher program. <laughs> In other words, to privatize it. In other words, um, Alice Rivlin who, by the way, was originally billed as a progressive when she first came into Washington. Everybody thought that she was a progressive and kind of Keynesian. Not so, not so. I actually heard her speak in the 1960s, came in the 1970s. She was a very, very pleasant and very, very friendly woman and very bright and always seemingly very, very reasonable. But as Dave Dayan says, she wasn't just a neutral scorekeeper. She had a perspective. And he credits her with being the tone setter for, CBO, for CBO's work for its first 45 uh, uh, years. When did the 45 years end? In 2019, when she died. And he says, quote, it's hard to argue that her viewpoint didn't seep into the bones of the agency. She was the head of it herself from 1975 to 1983, and Reichauer succeeded her. I forget for how long. He was there, I think, for at least another four years. Her colleague, okay, from Brooklyn, she just switched seats with him. Anyway, she sought to expand the agency's purpose okay, and profile, anticipating um, economic issues as well as reacting to individual pieces okay, of legislation. And so Lilly, Scott Lilly, who was um, the earlier quoted, who's now with 
Hillary Clinton's favorite think tank, the Center for American uh, Progress. He says, quote, I remember one report I objected to strenuously. Uh, and then he says, okay, that around the time that the D.C. Metro was funded, they did a report saying that the energy required to build the Metro more than offset the energy savings. Okay, that was true in one sense, but it ignored the reality that one of the major benefits of Metro was a radical change in land use, which ultimately was where the energy savings was going to come from. Was, was coming from, um, unquote. So CBO has been pretty nonpartisan okay, over all these years. If you think okay, that partisanship has to do with party, um, 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 the CBO was hard on President Carter's budget, and particularly energy policy of um, President Carter. <coughs> and it was hard on the Republican budgets of President Ford. <coughs> so... It didn't matter to CBO whether it was a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. CBO's partisanship, however, was always the same. It was the partisanship of those who favor austerity uh, versus those who prefer a public purpose who prefer doing things for people, who prefer reducing um, inequality. The budget window that, oh, they projected out at first was only five years. But for some reason, since the 1990s, okay, the late 90s, it was extended to 10 years. <coughs> okay, now, they couldn't project even over six months accurately. But here they are. They want to extend the initial five years to 10 years, which they did extend, which they did get. Every progressive piece of legislation that was proposed in Congress during these years had to run the gauntlet of the CBO. And that gauntlet was a formidable um, 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 obstacle. So this happened year after year, okay, after uh, uh, a year. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole article. Now, I got the first name, okay, of Reichauer wrong. It was actually Robert Reichauer. I don't know why I... I misremember his name. It's been a long time since he's been around. I was around then, though. He was the third okay, of the directors of CBO. I thought he was the second. So Kelton describes 
Um, the CBO's posture is short-run Keynesian and long-run classical. Under this modeling, spending will create a short-term boost in the economy. But over time, Keynesian spending is going to crowd out um, investment by the private sector. Now, that's a myth. Oh, that's a myth. But the neoclassical economists and their models supported that myth continuously. And those models were what CBO was using. When Kelton worked for Sanders on the committee, okay, the budget committee, she met with CBO's top um, economist about a $1 trillion infrastructure bill that, that Bernie wanted. And she said, quote, walk me through the crowding out thing. She recalls. Uh, her argument was, if the deficit increases, then interest rates go up and people know that future tax rates will be higher, so they draw out of the labor force, um, unquote. And so Dayan says, you'd have to ignore more than a decade of fairly large deficits with no correspondent interest rate, uh, rise to still believe this. Kelton, for her part, has a different conception of fiscal policy, specifically modern monetary theory-based conception. She believes that leaving money in the economy through more government spending or tax cuts would reduce interest rates as the deficit increases, in effect, crowding in more private um, investment. So Kelton asked about this in her meeting with the CBO macroeconomist. She said, how do you allow for crowding in effects from um, um, investment? And Stephanie then says, she looked at me like I had three horns. And then she said, that's what they do. They let their assumptions drive the analysis. So that's the way CBO is. It doesn't, it's driven by its assumptions. It doesn't like to use empirical data or to acknowledge that on the record of empirical data, um, um, its assumptions are constantly being um, invalidated. I mean, this is a scandal because it's supposed to be based in empirical science, and it is not. Here's a quote from Joyce. If you have a bunch of bills in Congress about health care, CBO cares that it's not disadvantaging some bills compared to others because it's using different assumptions. So a particular bill doesn't become law because it's analyzed one way okay, and not some other way. Those assumptions evolve when new information reveals them to be incorrect. But by that time, they've already been employed many times over. For example, CBO does not actually predict any recessions. While the standard CBO forecasts assume full employment, in its 10-year projections, it assumes a somewhat higher average uh, unemployment rate on the assumption that there will be a recession somewhere in that time period. That works for consistency, but not necessarily for the accuracy of the projections of CBO. Um, um, other assumptions are more controversial. CBO scores so-called um, automatic stabilizer benefits that kick in when the economy is in a downturn, like unemployment benefits or food stamps, as if they will be fully utilized 
but this tends to exaggerate the costs of such uh, policies, um, says Dave. Um, CBO also assumes a benchmark that only 6% of funds appropriate for road, uh, um, but for road construction will spend out in the first year. If you put money into highways as a way to get people back to work, say you put an extra $10 billion in, their estimate is only $600 million in the first year, says Lilly. We would try to force a more rapid buildup in the program, and they wouldn't agree. So in other words, they wouldn't support getting out of a recession uh, more quickly by spending more money in that first year when it was really needed. That's why people would turn to tax cuts, or one of the reasons why people would turn to tax cuts. It's also one of the reasons why they would turn to things like uh, um, trying to build up uh, the social safety net, because that sort of thing would have immediate impact. We're spending on infrastructure uh, would not have immediate impact, in part because CBO wouldn't allow it to have immediate impact. So the article goes further and talks about the failure of CBO to factor in the benefits of carbon uh, the emissions reductions when putting in uh, its estimates for uh, environmental policy. In other words, it doesn't cost out the social cost of carbon. A more consequential assumption that CBO makes is that Social Security and Medicare will eat up general fund revenues once they deplete their respective trust funds. So here's something strange. The CBO to do this, says Dave, is actually prohibited by U.S. law. Though new laws could always alter that. But Congress, he says, perniciously added a rider in 1985 that effectively forces CBO to make this assumption. In other words, Congress hasn't actually passed a law that it's going to use any general revenues once the trust funds uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but go to zero. But it has passed a law forcing CBO to make the assumption that it's going to pass a law that when general fund revenues uh, when, I'm sorry, the trust funds are used up, that it's going to change the law to allow general fund revenues to be used. <laughs> okay, now, I think that's actually a uh, pretty good assumption, but if Congress is making that assumption, then why didn't it put it into law? Simply say, when the CB, uh, when the trust fund funds happen to run out, or the trust fund accounting value falls to zero, it will be paid for out of uh, by, uh, by general revenues. Now the truth is, the truth is, and this is not in the article. Social Security and Medicare now are paid for out of general revenues because the trust funds don't contain any money of them. They're just an accounting record. All of the payments come out of the same account. The treasury spending account, it all comes out of that account. So general revenue funds are used now to spend. But there's this law that depicts a fictitious um, 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 situation that uh, the executive branch is not allowed to use any general fund revenues 
to make payouts to Social Security once the funds go to zero. Uh, but even though the executive branch is currently using general fund revenues, <laughs> think about how stupid and contradictory this is. Because the Congress doesn't want to recognize that it didn't put any actual money into the trust funds. It's going to prohibit, it does prohibit, the use of general fund revenues once the trust fund accounting records go down to zero. Even though it's those general fund revenues that are now used to pay for Social Security and for Medicare. I mean, this can just blow one's mind. So CBO, of course, since it's forced to make this assumption, it rapidly kicks up uh, the projections for the debt to GDP ratio by adding previously prohibited Social Security and Medicare spending to the federal bottom line when it projects that the trust funds are going to run out. So that's what it does in making these crazy forecasts. Of course, the 10-year projections, okay, of CBO, uh, do not yet get to the timeline when Social Security is going to run out. But I believe they now have gotten to the year when the Medicare trust fund is supposedly going to get to zero. So that's why some of their later debt-to-GDP ratio um, forecasts are starting to get large because they have to take account of the assumption uh, that Congress okay, is going to appropriate the Medicare spending anyway. So Dave Dayen's article then makes the correct point that the subsequent scary-sounding projections of debt give politicians a tool to resist the progressive agenda. A very powerful tool. A very powerful tool. So I'll go by some more of this. Okay. Oh, this is a very long article. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go through the whole thing. But... Uh, the bottom line here is that uh, the projections okay, of CBO okay, are not accurate. CBO does not have um, economics, does not have the technical capability to project um, accurately um, over a period okay, of years. Take as an example the Trump uh, tax cuts. As the law was being rushed through Congress at the end of 2017, says Dave Dayan, CBO's initial forecast was that it would cost $1.438 trillion over the next 10 years. But by April 2018, four months later, that estimate had ballooned to $1.889 trillion a 31% uh, increase in four months. This came about because they would change the assumptions about revenue losses from the corporate tax changes. And that was even before the business lobby went to work to extract further gifts from the regulatory interpretations of the Trump administration. Uh, to comply with uh, the reconciliation instructions on the budget. 
Republicans were required to hold the 10-year cost of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act under $1.5 uh, trillion. But four months later, it was clear to CBO this wasn't going to happen. But there was no way to rerun the process and invalidate the law because CBO changed its interpretation. Of course, the Republicans could have passed this bill anyway, but only through a reconciliation process. If they didn't do a reconciliation process, they wouldn't have been able to avoid a filibuster by the Senate. They wouldn't have had the votes uh, just from the Republicans to pass uh, the giant uh, tax cut. So, uh, the difficulty, okay, of CBO actually projecting even out a few months enabled a giant tax cut for the wealthy. So, Dan says, we don't have to dig deep to find these uh, CBO adjustments and errors. They're all on the agency's website. CBO continually updates reviews and assesses its um, um, projections. It offers a budget outlook and then reruns it in the mid-year. By the way, as I said yesterday, it doesn't offer a budget outlook um, at the beginning of the fiscal year. The beginning of the fiscal year is in October. It doesn't offer its budget outlook until three months into the fiscal year. And then it reruns it okay, at mid-year, three months before the end of the fiscal year. Yes, it's mid-calendar year, but it's three-quarters of the way through the fiscal year. But, of course, it annually checks federal revenues, outlays, and deficits to see how reality matched its theory. The fiscal year 2019 uh, review revealed that it overestimated uh, revenues by 0.8%. Other papers it has look at Oh, their projections, okay, of the deficit and their revenue projections going back to the 1980s. And those show very large efforts due mostly to recessions that overestimated their tax revenues by as much as 25%. CBO also missed the surpluses during the late uh, Clinton years. Then... As the Clinton years were ending, they forecasted enough surpluses to retire the national debt until George W. Bush slashed um, taxes and flipped the budget back into the red. So notice, in 2000, the CBO was forecasting enough surpluses to retire the national debt. So CBO was many, many trillions of dollars off in its 10-year projection from the year 2000. It was like three or four trillion dollars off. Anyway. CBO does adjust its assumptions based on empirical data uh, after the fact, but it takes some time for it to, uh, to actually do so. Uh, so it's always behind the curve in the assumptions it makes. But the politicians have to act. In other words, they act. They act on the CBO assumptions at the time or the CBO projections at the time, which are based on um, faulty assumptions. So since they're based on faulty assumptions, 
Also, the policies are based on faulty assumptions. So the effects of the policies are always unanticipated because they're based on bad assumptions. But within Congress, CBO is revered. And Stephanie Kelton points out that the word of CBO is really like the word of God in Washington. If you propose anything, the first question they ask is, what would CBO say? Barack Obama's advisors kept the options for the stimulus package to $800 billion, much smaller than the economic hole it needed to fill. How much smaller? Well, one of the economists, one of the advisors um, to Obama on the National Economics uh, Council counseled that the stimulus bill be $1.8 trillion to end uh, the, uh, the crash of 2008 okay, by Christina Romer put forward a proposal um, but to Larry Summers for $1.8 trillion for the stimulus bill. The eventual bill was $1 trillion smaller than that at $800 billion. So yeah, it was smaller than the hole it needed to fill. But what was driving that mistake by Obama? Well, he didn't want to seek a higher number because that would produce a high CBO score. A high CBO score. Because they were afraid of a high CBO score, they made a $1 trillion error in the size of the stimulus bill. And they produced, they produced as a result the slowest recovery from a recession in history up to that particular point. And it wasn't just the size of the stimulus bill. Also, to try to get bipartisan support from the Republicans, they designed the stimulus bill so it would not emphasize the highest multiplier spending because that spending was not as much favored by other programs that they would include in the stimulus package, more likely to get the support of some of the Republican congressmen and some of the senators okay, from the Republican Party. As it turned out, of course, the silly Democrats trying to compromise okay, with the Republicans in order to get some bipartisan support got not one Republican vote in either the House or the Senate for their $800 billion loser that produced the slowest recovery from a recession in history. In fact, Christina Romer's proposal for a $1.8 trillion bill didn't even get to Obama's desk. Larry Summers, who was the chairperson of the National um, um, Economics um, Council, I forget whether it was the Council okay, of Economic Advisors then uh, or not, that was the earlier title okay, for the Council. Larry Summers, who was the chairperson, didn't want to present anything over a trillion to the President because he was sure Obama was going to reject it because of this fear of a high CBO score. Similarly, the cost of the Affordable Care Act was kept under an artificial threshold of $800 billion over 10 years, this is. In other words, a threshold that averaged only $80 billion a year, fearing the CBO score. 
That was a big reason why Obama didn't want to go for a Medicare for All. Of course, he had other reasons, including selling out to his donors and all this. But a great rationalization was that the Medicare for All bill was probably going to result in, well, over 10 years, it would obviously be many trillion dollars okay, in expenditure. Okay, I forget what our national health expenditures were okay at that time they were probably approaching two trillion dollars so you're probably i'm not talking about the government expenditures i mean the total national uh health expenditures so uh if there was a Okay, if the Medicare for All bill had been passed in 2009, then Congress would have been passing a bill that CBO would have given a score of uh, roughly something like $16 trillion to. Of course, Obama would never consider that. That was one of the reasons why he took the Medicare for All bill, H.R. 676, off the table back then. Okay, so what's the bottom line of all this? I'm taking a long time to get through this. And I want to give you a chance to comment as well. So I'm going to make the big point. That big point is we need to get rid of CBO. We need to get rid of the PAYGO system that also depends upon the CBO and its budgetary estimates. It's all nonsense. CBO does not have the capability to make estimates that are accurate, that can really serve as a guide um, 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 for the future. But much more fundamentally, much more fundamentally, the objective of congressional budgeting should not be to get to a particular debt to GDP ratio or get to a particular deficit figure or surplus figure um, before the budget. The United States is a monetary sovereign and to a monetary sovereign, those things do not matter for solvency. They don't matter for the fiscal solvency of the federal government. No matter how high the deficit is, it can't force the federal government into fiscal insolvency. The federal government can always pay the bill. No matter how high the debt is, no matter how high the debt to GDP ratio is, the federal government cannot be forced into um, um, insolvency. The government always has the power, the authority to pay its obligations, to pay its bills. So fiscal sustainability should not be about the amount of the deficit. It should not be amount. Uh, it should not be about the amount of the debt. It should not be amount. It should not be about the debt to GDP ratio projection, as it is in the NZ White House bill we talked about, okay, just yesterday. What it should be about is the projections of actual outcomes, which of course are very problematic and cannot be done themselves over a 10 year period or over a five year period or even over a one year period. What we need, though, from a congressional agency on budget and policy priorities, what we need okay, are short-range projections of the impact of our policies. And our budgets need to be based on these short-range guesses, their best guesses that should be based on analysis 
and the guesses should be adjusted every few months and policies should be adjusted every few months in order to take account of where the economy has been and where it is going. We need an adaptive, constant adjustment, agile process of budgeting and policy making. How can we make it agile? Well, the MMT economists uh, say that the way that can best be done is through strengthening the automatic stabilizers the federal government uh, um, um, actually relies upon and also having uh, long-term goals like the goals set forth in the Green New Deal proposals and in other broad-ranging policy proposals. What we need are ways of seeing how federal spending has impacted um, 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 our progress to these goals okay, and uh, the purposes that the goals actually serve and the collection okay, of purposes would constitute the public purpose of the United States as defined by the people and the representatives of the people in Congress. It should be all about the public purpose, the impact on the goals and objectives that serve the public purpose, and it should be adaptive and should be changed dynamically over the short run. We need to get rid of the CBO process. Now, I'm calling here for the abolition of the CBO, but I don't really care whether the CBO okay, is abolished or whether the CBO is completely restructured and reoriented to constantly analyze the shifting budget okay, and uh, also policy priorities of the federal government. But it's the latter kind of agency we need under the supervision of the Congress. We're not getting that now. Okay. And in order to get it, we need to completely reconstruct the CBO um, into something else. We need to change its name. This may require that some of the present staff of the CBO has to go because they're not skilled. They don't have the technical capability to analyze impacts okay, of this kind. They've been focusing too much on the fantasy world of what's going to happen with budgets six months down the road or one year down the road or five years down the road or ten years down the road. They may not have the capability to do real policy impact analysis. Entirely new models would be needed, okay, to do this. And so Dean Baker says, okay, according to Dave Dayan, the next uh, Democratic president, quote, needs to line up the economists and engage uh, CBO. Okay, quote again, I would trust they would be prepared to say, Here's what CBO says, and here's why it's wrong. Yes, exactly. But even more fundamentally, as I said, we need to restructure and reconstruct the CBO uh, entirely. And I believe that that's one thing Bernie Sanders is going to do post-haste. Post haste uh, when he gets in. So Sheldon Whitehouse and Mike Enzi are wasting their time right now. They're wasting their time. Because when Bernie gets in, which is becoming increasingly likely, 
he's going to change that whole budgeting process and the whole projection process. And it's going to be much more interdisciplinary than it is now. And it's not going to be playing the neoclassical and austerity games um, any longer. That's going to be a matter for the past. I hope it's a matter that's not too quickly forgotten because the history of CBO and the impact, okay, the impact of CBO has been disastrous for the American economy and for our politics. And I say good riddance to very bad stuff. So, I'm going to check in with you now, but first, please share, like, and subscribe. Okay, especially when this gets onto YouTube. And please become a patron at www.patreon.com front slash Joe underscore Firestone. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm going to check in with you now and see what you've been doing. And Steve says, we're all in Facebook jail, but we can still post to our pages. Keep fighting. Yes, I agree. I agree. Okay. Sandy Degg says, hi, Sandy. Nice to see you here. She says, I'm so afraid, okay, that the DNC's uh, Mr. Perez, um, Tom Perez, is stacking the deck against Bernie. Okay, says he's been trying with Sandy Degg. Steve says he already has. Hi, Kay. And Kay says, hi, Steve. And Charles Lovett has joined, and Rick Maynard has joined. Hi, guys. And Steve says John Podesta is an exposed pedo, uh, but, uh, but by WikiLeaks and probably put the hit on Seth Rich. How the DNC can embrace this evil is beyond me. Well, it's because the DNC is pretty evil. I mean, let's face it. That's what we're, uh, we're working to change. Okay, and Greg Mallet has joined again, and Steve says, share, share, share. Let's get at least 20 on this thread. Thank you, guys. Thank you, people. And Rick says, yeehaw, I can comment, Joe. I'm going to post the show as a comment on your YouTube channel as a comment. Thank you, Rick. Steve says, I'm in FB jail, but going to invite some friends. And Russ says, Bring on Stephanie Kelton to retask the CBO. No more sound finance analysis. Bring on the functional finance agenda. Exactly. We're talking about the functional finance agenda, Russ. That's what we're doing here tonight. Okay, and Evelina Pont says, don't bother, already there. And Rick Maynard says, okay, I posted as a comment here, a potentially harmful Bipartisan budget process bill and some quick news items. Yeah, that was the last one. And Steve says, we can't have nice things. The billionaires own everything. Look, since the United States is a monetary sovereign, it's very easy to fix the problem of the millionaires having all the money is very easy to fix. All we have to do is to create a lot more money and put it in the hands of the non-millionaires. There's something very important that I really say here these days. A lot of you okay, are familiar with it, but for those of you who are not, 
when the government has a deficit, the non-government, the private sector and the foreign sector together have a surplus. It's a surplus. And most of the non-government sector is the domestic private sector. So most of the time it's true that when the government has a deficit, the private sector has a surplus. So most of the time, when the government has a surplus, the private sector has a deficit, has a deficit. When Clinton ran those four years of surplus, four years of surplus right at the end of Clinton's term, what Clinton was doing was gradually impoverishing the private sector. Now, this doesn't mean he was impoverishing you or I or any particular individual okay, or group. When I say what I just said, I'm not looking at the distributions. I'm talking about the private sector in the aggregate. But keep in mind, if the government sector has a deficit, and if that deficit is probably is properly targeted, at the 99%, then that's good for most of us. If it's targeted on the poor, that's good for the poor. If it's targeted on the middle class, that's good for the middle class. Because the government is in deficit and you are in surplus. And no, what does it matter if the government is in deficit? As long as the deficit is not so great and not so poorly targeted that it induces um, inflation, then the deficit is good for you and not bad for the government because the government can always pay its bills, can always run further deficits and the government doesn't even have to issue debt it chooses to issue the debt instruments that's left over from gold standard days left over from gold standard days it does not have to issue debt instruments under current law without changing the law it can use um, the platinum coin seniorage to pay off the national debt as it falls due. It could issue, the executive branch could issue a hundred trillion dollar coin under the law. It could force the Fed to credit, to credit that coin. Under current law, the public purse could be filled with that $100 trillion. Now, the federal government could not spend the $100 trillion. The spending is about the appropriations of Congress. But it could use the $100 trillion to spend congressional appropriations. It could use the $100 trillion to pay back the national debt and the interest on the national debt as it falls due. Technically, when I say the national debt, I mean the debt um, subject to the limit, which is the principle of all the debt instruments that are out there and have not been repaid. Okay. And Matt Hildebrand has joined, and Cora Emanuel has joined, and Gary Houck has joined. Hi, folks. Steve Wolfbrand says, I think Bernie might be that pesky wabbit, Doc. <laughs> the pesky wabbit, huh? <laughs> okay, says, I'm yawning already, laugh out loud. I hate all these gray days. Can't wake up. Sorry, Kay. Sorry you're yawning. I'm just getting going. Steve says, 
Nixon had a fake plan to end the Vietnam. We lost the war. Probably a good thing. So sorry for our troops. Well, now we lost the war in a certain sense. We certainly lost the war. We lost a lot of people. And the Vietnamese lost a lot more people. And what was it for? There was no domination K okay, of Vietnam by China. There was no domination K okay, of Vietnam uh, but by Russia. There was no expansion of communism into Thailand. It's very hard these days when we look at the history to argue that there would have been it was a war that was not in the interests of the United States. On my part, that's not hindsight. I was saying that um, at the time. In the 1960s, I was in various protests, okay, and demonstrations about the war, okay, in Vietnam. Uh, it was a bad time. Uh, the federal government was pursuing a bad policy. That policy ruined Lyndon Johnson's presidency. He could have been a great president if he had not escalated the war in Vietnam, but instead ended the war okay, in Vietnam. And it was so costly in terms of the troops. Okay, he says, yes, Steve, I went to D.C. to see the wall there, and it's heartbreaking. Um, I was at the Vietnam teaching in 1963. I was in graduate school at the time. We drove in, okay, from Michigan State. I won't forget this because we arrived in the middle of the night. And being, you know, very uh, um, 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 idealistic uh, by young people, uh, the first thing we did was to drive over to see Mr. Lincoln. We visited Mr. Lincoln at roughly 2 o'clock in the morning. We were there for about a half hour. And the cops came and chased us out. <laughs> then we found our hotel and sacked out and went to the teaching the next day. K. Ryan said, I went with a Vietnam vet, so it was double emotional for both of us. Evelina says, isn't the billionaire's business um, buying up the millionaire's millions? <laughs> you bet it is these days. We need to stop that. And she says, glad I went with him, though. He needed to see that they were not um, totally forgotten. So now we're friends with Vietnam, but uh, uh, um, those veterans uh, lie homeless in the streets. No, no. We don't uh, um, uh, forget. Uh, we just don't do anything to help them. So how do we get rid of the CBO? CBO is a creature of Congress. All Congress has to do is change the law. It can get rid of the CBO. It can reform the CBO. It can restructure the CBO. We need a Congress that's under the control of Bernie Sanders. It's a political problem. It's a political problem we can solve. And it's one we have to solve. Congressional Budget Office.
Okay, he says, that time I went to D.C. made me realize how owned our government is by banks. Right across the street from the White House is every bank you ever heard of, and some I never heard of, and they are from other countries. Lana says, how do we get rid of CBO? As I just said, through legislation, we need to have a Congress that will get rid of the CBO. That doesn't mean that the whole Congress um, 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 has to be a progressive Congress, but there have to be enough people okay, who are progressive that combine with the leadership of the president and the fact that there's always a presidential party that serves the president, whoever is the president. If we can manage those two things, we may be able to get a majority to reform, restructure, and essentially get rid of the CBO. Okay, says they always want to make the old and poor and vulnerable pay for it all. One way or another, most of these people die just before or after 65. Uh, they bevy, I'm not sure what that is. But okay, to make the point, the elderly who are poor and vulnerable now were paying twice as much as they had to pay roughly for their Social Security benefits in FICA contributions. Those contributions were nearly doubled by the compromise of 1983 that set up these fictitious trust funds. Kay points out, my late hubby died of cancer at 62. We were not uh, legally married, but I was with him over 20 years. Well, and you were legally married because that's common law marriage. And it is still legal in the United States. Steve says, they never collect the nothing, it's rigged. Exactly. He was due to get Social Security disability two months after he died. Kay says, vote Bernie. The whole thing is rigged. But if Bernie gets enough votes, they won't be able to deny him. Then. But he's probably got to get not a thousand votes um, at the convention or um, 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 however much he needs. Probably needs to get another 300 votes in order to actually secure the nomination. Nikki King says, what does CBO stand for? Congressional Budget Office. Thanks, Kay. No problem, Nikki. I wasn't sure either till I heard it here. Uh, And uh, Lana points out that the CBO is neoliberal at its core. Yes, yes. Um, um, Alice Rivlin created something that was neoliberal at its core. <laughs> she, in collaboration with her neoliberal friends, Okay, says, just another way to screw us all, right? Evelina says, new models for CBO that include the, the Green New Deal is what we need then. It's not simply new models that include, okay, the Green New Deal. CBO would be happy to score the Green New Deal. The problem is with the models they would use to score the Green New Deal. In other words, the underlying economic assumptions have to be changed, but they still shouldn't be assumptions that financially score the Green New Deal. We don't need that kind of uh, financial scoring in terms of what kinds of deficits it would bring, what kind of debt, okay, what kind of, you know, of debt to GDP ratio. We don't need that stuff. We need impact analysis impact analysis, what the policies would bring over a short period of time, 
and then we need constant adjustments of those policies. We need to be agile. The government needs to be dynamic, much more than it is now. Kay says, that would be a good start. Uh, um, um, Evelina Russ says, good riddance to the CBO. That's what I say to Russ, as you know. Russ says, Dr. Joe, I'll see you again soon. I need to turn in. I know, Russ. Take care. Have a good sleep. And thank you for seconding the good readings to the CBO. Kay says, exactly, Evelina. And I think everybody is, is putting up all the likes in the hearts because Kay has said, well, guys, you need to get to bed. Can't get awake today. Or, Laugh out loud, have a peaceful night, and we'll talk soon. And Russ says, Dr. Joe, I'll see you again soon. I need to turn in. Steve says, good night. And I think it's probably time for me to say good night, too. Uh, so I'm going to say good night, unless there's something terribly, terribly pregnant that you want me to answer. I will also say good night. And wish you a very happy night. And I'll see you tomorrow. And I'll probably be talking green stuff tomorrow. At least that's on my current agenda. Because there is some green news. Again, it involves fights within the decrepit and corrupt Democratic Party. So good night all.